Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you this morning again with our soil health webinar. And uh, this is a very important topic in the sense that all agricultural activities in South Africa center around the health of the soil. Whether you're a cattle or a livestock producer, whether you're an agronomist, a fruit and vegetable producer, the baseline of your business should be the health of your soils. And that is why it's a privilege for us to present to you today a panel of some of the best known and highly regarded soil scientists in South Africa. Our next speaker is Dr. Hendrik Smith, one of the best known advocates of conservation agriculture in South Africa. And it's always a pleasure having you as part of, of the panel and the team, Hendrik. Would you please continue with your presentation and then also tell us a bit more about yourself, where you work, why you are so passionate about conservation agriculture and how important it is. Hendrik, the Hello, floor yes. is yours. Anneli, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, fantastic. I hope the system holds on my side. You never know. I so, hope yeah, so. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. And it's always a privilege to talk to you and talk about my favorite subject, which is soil health, but also conservation and regenerative agriculture, uh, which is actually one and, and the simple uh, same uh, subject topic uh, to talk about. So I'm a, a soil scientist, but also a conservation agriculture research facilitator at Asset, Asset Research and the Maze Trust. I've been working in this field uh, in the ALC for 20 years and then at Grain SA for eight years. And now we do the same um, uh, same work for uh, an asset research for various uh, uh, conditions and situations, trying to uh, develop sound sustainable, resilient conservation agricultural systems in different contexts uh, with working with farmers in different uh, areas of the country. So it's really exciting work that we do, important work trying to uh, revive the farming systems of farmers, but also address the environmental and economic uh, challenges that we have in the same manner. Okay, so uh, my talk as you can see there it's about soil health principles and practice you can also say conservation agriculture principles and practices i will talk about um let me just figure out the system here uh so what i will be talking about is what we have done it's important to just to, to realize uh, what is the situation what we have done as as as, as farmers as agriculture and what do we, we do now, from now on? What is our guiding star and good principles that we can follow and the benefits of doing something right in terms of soil health practices? So what have we done uh, to make way for agriculture in South Africa for the last about 400 years? We have uh, actually had a huge impact on the environment, on nature. As you know, there was a mass slaughtering of wildlife, including giant herds of trackbook. And that is quite important because that's how our nature worked in the past. And now it was soils and plants, vegetation, uh, biodiversity developed under these huge herds of trackbook that roamed in, um, in our uh, landscapes, most of our landscapes uh, for, for many million years. And then after that, when agriculture started, we did some land clearing, deforestation, division of land, including the division of, of thousands of farms and fencing in the country. And when we start uh, about 100 years ago, we started uh, plowing on our arable lands, which is about 12% of our land. And then we also bring in uh, domestic livestock. And we started with the grazing, mostly poor grazing practices. Uh, by, by our livestock. So what was the result? Just quickly, I know everyone else is going to talk about that, but the results of decades of tillage, we lost about half of our soil organic carbon. 
in our croplands. That resulted in seriously degraded soils and the reduced production capacity because carbon is actually the key ingredient of a healthy soil. Um, and we need to try and conserve and restore our carbon in our soil because we have lost it. We're trying to actually farm in our croplands on degraded soil. So we really need to think and have that restoration mentality as we, we move forward. Uh, part of that is um, of tillage, um, laying the land and the crops, uh, croplands bare. Uh, it led to a huge amount of water erosion, uh, up to 13 tons per hectare per year of soil loss from only water erosion. That is about uh, two to three tons of soil loss per every ton of maize that we produce every year. So that is not sustainable. And then wind erosion, uh, when we have bare soil, especially in the western parts, but also in the eastern parts of the country, we have soil loss from, from, from wind erosion. We have warmer landscapes and a decreasing chance of precipitation. There is a real concern also uh, for desertification. Des There's a lot of studies done on, on this, and uh, especially going into drier periods like the El Nino period that we are actually facing right now. We really need to be mindful and careful about bare soils and uh, com combined with, with tillage effects. Um, so this downward spiral of soil degradation, now everyone else uh, is talking about this, uh, the other speakers will also perhaps mention this, uh, we need to be mindful of what triggers this downward spiral of soil degradation, and that is usually disturbance or, or something like intensive tillage, uh, removing the soil organic matter, uh, clearing the surface, aggregates break down, more soil organic is lost, increased in erosion, a loss of crop yields, less water storage, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to turn this downward spiral upwards to an up, up going spiral of restoration and soil health. Just uh, one slide about uh, uh, climate change. Uh, as you can see there, uh, the, the temperature is going to move up if we are uh, going on practice as usual. We are right there in a critical opportunity to make the right choice. If we're going on in bus as business as usual, we're going towards a really dangerous territory in terms of climate change, global warming, temperatures increasing, especially in terms of food production. We really need to be careful and mindful what we are doing from now onwards. If we are doing making the right choices, especially also in terms of agriculture, we can bend that curve downwards because agriculture can reduce our carbon emissions that have it, this huge influence on, on climate change. We can actually draw down the carbon out of the atmos atmosphere with conservation agriculture and improved soil health practices, and we can cool down the earth by regenerating, restoring the natural biosystem through agriculture. That's the only big message I want to share here. So to make it easy for us in agriculture, we only have two choices. Remember that previous slide? We have the choice now. We have two choices about the way we treat our ecosystems, including climate, soil. The first choice is we can manage in a manner which causes ecosystem health, including soil health, to spiral downwards towards desertification. Remember that downward spiral? And then also the second choice, we can manage to regenerate ecosystem health, including soil health, where health, profits, production and well-being will spiral upwards. We have these two choices. We can only manage for improvement or damage to an ecosystem. There is no in-between. We must make the right choices right now. Okay, so our step one is we need a better understanding of ecology, of nature, and how to mimic that nature and use nature in our restoration regenerative journey. If you look at, into that picture on your right hand, that's a snapshot of nature. What do you see? I'm going to quickly help you here. 
course of time, what do we see in nature? Because we, we need to try and mimic that as best as possible in our agricultural systems. We see a living ecosystem, which is driven mostly by, e by photosynthesis, by the sun energy. We see an interconnected and interdependent above and below ground system. We see closed and stable cycles. In other words, the spiral is going up, not down in a natural sustained ecosystem. We, we see functioning food webs and processes. And from that we see and experience natural free services of water, nutrients, pests and diseases. So ecosystem health, like the foundation of a pyramid, is the foundation of any agricultural business and drives both productivity and profitability. That's really the key message I want to send here. And just a reminder, what, like I said, what, what was nature in South Africa about uh, more than 400 years ago for millions of years? Remember these big uh, herds of trackwalker roaming over the landscapes in the grasslands, savannas, Karoo areas? had a huge impact on the development and development of our soils and vegetations and biodiversity. Uh, it could be uh, springboks, global abeers, chemspok, whatever. And they had a huge effect on um, our system. So we need to, when we think of nature, we need to think of these kind of systems and think of how in our system, in our context, on our farm, how can we move closer to that? And what are the principles, the guidance, that guiding star that we glean from our picture of this healthy, natural ecosystem or nature? Now, that's where we need to, to go from here and find the right principles in, in nature. The first one is soil health and understanding that soil is at the heart of sustainable agriculture, healthy food and healthy people. And, and, and there's this guarantee, if you take care of your soil or your land, the land will take care of you. That's one of the few guarantees in life. So uh, I know Gerard and maybe Machaba will speak about the soil food web. So I. Uh, I don't want to dwell into much detail here, but just to say that we can look into soil health in from different uh, angles uh, to understand it better, to in order to manage it better. And the soil food web is is a really a great way to look at the, the, the soil food web, driven by that picture, the yellow thing in the top. So I will move on. So I just wanted to say that I um, was busy saying that the soil food web is really is a interesting and practical, pragmatic way to, to look at soil. And I'm sure Karat and maybe Machaba will talk more about that. We can also carry on with this discussion afterwards. Uh, but uh, the, a healthy soil food web um, driven by the right principles will build soil, will build healthy soil, um, etc. All right, so just to give you a glimpse of, of what beautiful, wonderful creatures you find in the soil food web, just to give you a, a, a visual picture of these wonderful creatures, uh, I just want to flash a few names. Uh, you'll see on your left hand side, you will find bacteria. Just remember in the soil, there's, there, there's more living organisms in a handful of soil than people on Earth. So we're not talk, talking about a few organisms. Uh, it's really millions and millions of organisms in the soil. And they all play a huge, important role to create healthy soils, to create, to, to provide all these free uh, functions and services uh, for, for the nature and for all living creatures uh, on Earth. So we find bacteria, we find protozoa, fungi, mycorrhiza, millipedes, springtails, nematodes, and Harold will talk a lot about the nematodes, earthworms, dung beetles, mites, more beautiful mites, 
poll bugs, etc. Those are just a few of the millions of organisms that we find in the soil. And they all are so, so important to build healthy soil. And we need to look after them. And remember, they will look after us. And just another reminder that most of these organized organisms are found around the roots in the soil. So roots are going to play a huge important role in building healthy soils. So you can see that there's over 1,000 to 2,000 times more microbes associated with a live root than in a bulk soil. So we need to keep that into our mind and, and, and make sure that uh, we think about living roots when we farm out there. We will come back to that. So healthy soil is the cornerstone of life, providing free functions and services. More life, more of these wonderful creatures in the soil will mean more carbon in the soil, will help us to, to, to have more water in the soil, more nutrients, and that will lead to higher stable production of nutritious foods. But we need to have a better understanding of soil and how to put that life back into our soils and to restore, regenerate the soil. We need to first think of soil as a living ecosystem. It's not a dead growing material. It's a living ecosystem. If you look at that picture, you can almost feel the life. You can see the life in it. So think of that uh, and keep this picture in your mind as a guiding star to, to build your healthy soil. And we need to think back of what are these principles that we can implement to build healthy soils. And I'm quickly going to run through the, 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 the principles of soil health, also called the principles of conservation or regenerative agriculture. And the first one here is to minimize soil disturbance. And if we do that with uh, in, in grain crop systems, uh, with uh, no-till planters, there you can see no-till planters. Uh, in other words, you can plant into the soil without disturbing, without plowing, directly into a, a well-covered mulch soil. You can use any one of these planters from hand operated, you can see on your right hand, top right hand, hand operated, animal operated, tractor operated, from small to huge planters, you can apply in any context to plant into your soil without disturbing. Uh, because remember, if you disturb the soil, you trigger, trigger that downward spiral of soil degradation. The next principle is to keep the soil covered. Um, there you can see the beautiful pictures of how soil is protected. We actually don't want to see the soil. We just want it to be covered by living or dead mulch. It protects the soil from erosion. It's food for microorganisms. It controls soil temperature. It suppresses weeds. And obviously, coming back to this picture, it restores and protects the soil and water cycle. If we don't have cover, on the soil, we won't allow water to infiltrate into the soil, filling the soil pores and healthy soil spawns beneath. Otherwise, it will just run off, it will disappear from your field, and the worst of it, it will take the soil with it through, to water, through water erosion. The next principle is to maximize crop and plant diversity through crop rotations, associations, and sequences. And there you see some examples in grain crops. Obviously, you can do it with horticulture, fruit, vegetables, etc. Uh, there's uh, normal crop rotations between uh, maize and soybean, for example, intercropping between maize. Uh, sunflower and other crops. We can see strip cropping, multi-species cover crops, etc. There's various ways that we can increase the diversity. Because remember, that's a principle from nature. We are talking about principles to improve uh, nature's uh, health, soil health. The next, just okay. So, I just want to emphasize the diversity of crops. Uh, because remember, we want to maximize above and below ground, uh, in other words, root diversity year round, because that is a natural system. And for maximum photosynthetic capacity, it's really important uh, to maximize photosynthesis because it draws down 
the energy, the carbon out of the atmosphere using sun energy and it continuously feed the soil system below ground through the release of, of root exudates, exudates or carbon uh, into the soil. Uh, so just remember that principles. We also do that with multi-species cover crop mixtures in summer and winter. So here we plant up to six, 10, 15 different species, summer or winter species together um, in rotation with cash crops. And we typically use that to integrate livestock, integrate animals. That's another principle. We want animals in, in the system uh, utilizing the cover crops. Uh, if you think back of the natural system, uh, huge herds of track box, we want to mimic that impact of the, of the big herds on the soil through the dung, the urine, the saliva, the trampling of the, of the hooves. Uh, on the soil has a huge impact on soil health. We need to try and integrate that into our systems, whether it's grain crop, livestock systems, um, horticulture systems, nuts, citrus, anything we can try and integrate different species of livestock into our system. Uh, so I just want to mention that the restoration of and conservation of our felt is really also part of this picture. We want to apply the same principles here. And uh, in terms of grazing, thinking back of the way uh, nature did it for millions of years, we talk about uh, a system of holistic or ultra high density, high density, non-selective rotational grazing as nature did it. For millions of years and then you can see a picture of that on natural felt ecosystems in south africa so i'm trying to close here um uh, just to recap what we have been saying to each other so if we have the principles applied uh, with quality in your own unique context as a farmer that will lead to healthy soil which will lead to healthy plants leading to healthy animals, leading to healthy food production and healthy people. That is the sequence. That is the, the golden rule. We want to apply all the principles with quality, leading to the desired effects that we want to, 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 to reach. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, case study that we also find in our research projects in South Africa that we are where we're starting to me measure soil health on your left hand side you will see soil carbon percentage soil seed percentage going up till seven and this farmer Gabe Brown started with no-till practices in 1993 and you can see the low level of soil carbon and then he made a change to crop rotations you can see the the, the carbon moved up slightly he started with normal, simple, single species cover crops for a couple of years from 98. And then in 2008, he started with multi-species cover crop rotations with his cash crops and livestock integration. Uh, and he stopped using uh, external uh, inputs like fertilizers and chemicals. And then he also started with livestock integration. And you can see with that blue line, what happens with soil health if you apply all the principles with quality? Your soil carbon, in other words, soil health just jumps up to the ceiling. And at this stage, his level is around 10, more than 10% of soil carbon in the soil, just applying um, the principles correctly. So this is my last slide, and I will leave it here. There's so many benefits of, of soil health or regenerative conservation agriculture not only soil health, but uh, positive impact on biodiversity, profitability, food quality, carbon sequestration rate. In other words, pulling down the carbon out of the atmosphere where it causes problems with climate change. Uh, higher resource use efficiency. In other words, higher efficiency with water and nutrient use and then also a possibility to mitigate and adapt to climate change building resilient farming systems 
And that is my story. I'm happy to leave it here, finally, and um, continue with uh, my colleagues' discussions and um, presentations and discussions afterwards. No? Uh, I read somewhere that uh, healthy soils, a teaspoon of healthy soils, could contain as much as, let me get the figure right, 600 billion microorganisms. That shows and, and underpins the intricate relationship that goes on in the soil. Absolutely, Anneli. I, I, I touched on that, and I'm sure Gerard and Mahaba will also speak about that. Uh, this, 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 I think 95% of life on land is in the soil, and it plays, uh, plays a huge role uh to to create healthy soils but also healthy ecosystems providing food and fodder and water for everything that lives on top of the soil and if we look after those little creatures all those zillions of creatures below the soil they will look after us we just need to apply these principles uh correctly um in our context where we farm uh, where we live whether it's a big farm, small farm, backyard in your in, in the cities, etc., we can all apply these principles, looking after the these little millions of creatures and organisms, and and um, providing healthy ecosystems and food for for the people. And then I I know that regenerative ag agriculture as well as conservation agriculture has come a long way in South Africa. And I also know that you've been involved with a multitude of, of projects where you've helped local communities, farmers, emerging farmers to restore the soil health in their areas and where they work. Could you please share with us one or two of your successes? Oh, yes, uh, that's, that's a really long and wonderful interesting story Anneli um that's that's a webinar on its own but let's touch on some of the um uh details you know some case studies maybe some examples I mean we've started to to do some research on conservation agriculture um in the 90s starting to work with farmers starting that that's a lot of uh, projects with smallholder farmers in Mahabu but Chloe here, one of the speakers, was my colleague in the ARC, uh, where we did a lot of really interesting projects, mostly with small elders. Um, uh, and and uh, one thing I want to say here is to, to work with farmers is going in, in conservation agriculture is really important because, first of all, farmers are the drivers of conservation agriculture. Uh, they experience problems in and on their farms like soil erosion and they see they need to do something about this and they start with a change they're starting to look for answers with their neighbors across uh, in other countries and they started uh, with uh, the implementation adaptation of conservation or regenerative agriculture principles on their farm and that started in the 80s 90s already in South Africa especially in places like KwaZulu Natal and, and the Western Cape and uh, it is has been driven by the lead pioneer conservation farmers where they started to work with other farmers um, in their areas forming study groups and and that's how it spread not only in south africa but right across the world in, in so in south africa uh there's about almost two million hectares under conservation agriculture mostly done by by commercial farmers uh, which is about 25 percent of uh, of all crop livestock um, areas or grain cropping areas in south africa which is by far the most in africa in terms of adoption by far it, we are 12 on the list of adoption of conservation agriculture in in the world in the world yes um and uh, this is mostly um done and led by by farmers so what we do is forming projects and Mahabu and Gerrit 
has been doing uh, these kind of projects, working with these uh, type of products with the farmers. We farmers, we we taking hands with the farmers, creating projects, running trials on the on on their farms, and the farmer play a huge role in implementing these trials, measuring the trials, spreading the message of the results through farmers' days articles, uh, social media, etc. Et because we want to share the information to farmers in the area, in the country, et cetera. So we having these trials with farmers as our key colleagues around the country, um, trying to implement really interesting trials, cutting edge systems that we measure, the impact on soil health is, uh, and the measuring of that is always uh, top of our list, trying to figure out what is the impact of these systems on soil health, on, on the productivity, on the profitability of, of um, of the systems that we do with the farmers and uh, it's 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 a really interesting challenging as well and urgent because time is actually running out uh to uh for farmers to build up their resilience with these principles uh, for increasingly worsening climate conditions as is predicted by the scientists so that is in short only Maybe a, a next webinar we can delve in uh, deeper into into this story. Thank you so much, Hendrik, and we will talk to you later during the uh, uh, panel discussion. Yes, absolutely. Most welcome. Thank you. And now we are moving over to uh, Gerard de Prier. He is the nematode man. If are you there, Gerard? Are you Hello, ready everyone. To yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. This is Dr. Gerard de Prier. He's from the Northwest University, and he is his speciality and his field of expertise are nematodes. Gerard, can you please just tell us what a nematode is? <laughs> Okay, right. So um, I will show you one or two uh, images as well, but a nematode is more commonly known as a roundworm or an Afrikaans, an alvrum or an English. An so they're microscopic worms that are found in, in this hall and as well during the presentation. And uh, thank you. Now we know two. And would you okay, please can I just continue? Confirm, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we okay. can. Oh, well, thanks, Anne. Can you see my screen? Okay. okay. Right. So I'm going to just restart where I left off earlier. Um, so what I said is that, and this is actually very nice, building on what Hendrik now did as a bit of an introduction, is the role that nematodes and other soil organisms play in, this, in, in soil environments and how that builds resilience. All right. So I mentioned that, you know, we have to acknowledge that nematodes have a big issue in the sense that they are economically important. They can really cause uh, massive crop losses, um, actually resulting in total yield loss. Uh, the bottom left corner is an example of root knot infestation in a root. The bottom right corner is lesion nematode, where the roots are undergoing necrosis and dying back. So these three groups, the root knot nematodes, sit nematodes, and lesion nematodes, are within South Africa, but also globally, the most important in terms of the economic potential, the damage potential that they have. But what's really important and critical to understand is that they are being favored in what we call conventional agriculture system. For example, if you're planting a maize crop and a soybean crop in rotation, which is still regarded as conventional, but both those cultivars are susceptible to nematodes, then you will build their populations and continue building their populations, especially again, the herbivores or the plant parasites. It's in conservation or regenerative agriculture systems where we try to favor the beneficial nematodes so the group of nematodes that you know are to the benefit of farmers that benefit soil health to help build their populations because they have a number of additional benefits they give us one of which is actually the regulation of the plant parasites and that's what i want to get to and show you this top left video first so this is actually a video of omnivore the genus is called pristionchus and you can see in this video where this nematode is actually feeding on another nematode. You 
given the margin, this nematode that's being fed on being a plant parasite. So that nematode, the omnivore, is helping to regulate the populations um, of the plant parasites. The truth is, though, that the good guys are, as nature would have it, the most sensitive. So when we apply chemicals in our fields, when we disturb the soil through physical tillage, for example, then the good guys are the guys that go out the window first, unfortunately. This is another video in the top right corner. This is mononchus. Um, it's a predator nematode, meaning that it only feeds on other nematodes. It's, uh, it's, it's actually quite graphic, this video, but this is literally what's happening in the soil. Uh, this predator nematode is feeding on other nematodes, again, you know, contributing to that pest and disease regulation. Now, Hendrik mentioned that nematodes and soil organisms are incredibly diverse, and there's also hundreds and thousands to millions of them in the soil. Now, there's one quote from a very famous nematologist from the 20th century that I think really captures, um, you know, the ubiquitous distribution of nematodes and their nature. So Nathan Cobb, he said that of all the matter in the universe except the nematodes were swept away, our world would still be dimly recognizable. And if, as disembodied spirits, we could then investigate it, we should find these mountains, hills, vales, rivers, lakes, and oceans represented by a film of nematodes. I just think that's a, a brilliant quote that summarizes how widely distributed the nematodes are and that we really can find them everywhere. Now, what I also mentioned is that there are different groups. Um, so one classification that we frequently use is um, by feeding group or also referred to as trophic groups. So we have unicellular feeders. They feed on yeast, algae, lichens, bacterivores, and fungivores. As you can imagine, they link very close to the microbiome. Herbivores, that's just another term for plant parasites or plant feeders. Omnivores, which is the Prisionchus genus I showed you first on the video. Omnivores just means that during one of the stages of its life cycle, for example, a juvenile stage, it would feed on algae, on bacteria, but during a later stage, for example, it would feed on other nematodes. Predators, in turn, feed solely on other nematodes, and then EPNs, or entomopathogenic nematodes, they actually feed and parasitize insects. And what's great about them is that they can be utilized and are widely utilized, especially in Europe, to help control as a biological method um, insect pests, especially in agricultural systems. All right, so the thing is, we know now that nematodes you know, represent different groups. They are widely distributed. They are in great numbers, especially in healthy systems. But what do they actually do? So we saw a picture earlier of a soil food web. This is just another illustration. And as you know, the soil food web is really a depiction of how energy flows within soils from energy that gets input through the process of photosynthesis all the way through to your higher trophic levels that include your predators. Now, what's great about nematodes is that they actually occupy multiple positions within the soil food web. Now, I'm not taking anything away from fungi and bacteria, but I want to you know, re-emphasize that, that fungi and bacteria represent one level or one component of the soil food web, but nematodes actually represent multiple levels. So what's great about that is that they are actually really good bioindicators, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But the reason is because of, if one group of nematodes are affected, was affected, then we'll see that in the change that we record in the soil food web because they are so representative of the larger process. But they also have very specific processes that they contribute towards. The first one is stimulation. So you know, herbivores, as I mentioned, are bad in agricultural settings because they, they parasitize on our crops. But the truth is that in more natural settings and forests and grasslands, they also have an important role to play. Root feeders or herbivores actually help stimulate root growth by selectively feeding on roots. It's when we select for them in a monoculture system when their populations grow to such an extent that they, they cause uh, plant death. Fungal and bacterial feeders actually also have a stimulating effect. So bacterial and fungivores feed on bacteria and fungi, and by doing so, again, they stimulate the growth of fungi and bacteria in the soils. So that's, of course, very important. Also regulation. For example, as I mentioned before, we've got predator nematodes. They can feed on pests and diseases in the soil, for example, plant parasitic nematodes. So they help us regulate those populations. The same goes again for bacterial and fungal feeders, because they can feed on bacteria and fungi pathogens that would otherwise infect and pose a risk to our crops. Nutrient cycling is another key process that nematodes contribute towards. 
So as you can imagine, nematodes feed, but they can't utilize 100% of the food or the energy they consume. So a lot of it gets excreted as waste. And it's that waste then becomes available in a mineral form that's uptake for plants or can be utilized by the rest of the soil ecosystem. Of course, they also serve as a food source. As you can see here in the soil food web, the trophic arrows point to the arthropods or the larger predators that also then feed on nematodes. So nematodes themselves also serve as a food source. And finally, transport, something that's not always talked about, but it is actually quite important, is that especially fungi and bacteria can attach to the cuticles of nematodes. And when nematodes migrate in the soil, they then actually aid the dispersion of bacteria and fungi in the soil, another key process they contribute towards. So now we know how nematodes play a role in soil food webs and the functioning soils, but how does this really relate to the bigger picture of soil health? So I should probably mention that we have a way of oversimplifying the concept of soil health, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we have to also recognize that soil health is, and what's happening in the soil is actually immensely complex. We have learned a lot, but there's still a lot to be learned. But this particular mind map, or we can call it maybe an interaction map, I find uh, you know, really intriguing because it just shows the complexity of what's really happening in the soil. So what we're seeing here is in the darker brown circles of the nodes, we've got the different soil organisms and they link to the beige colored circles of nodes, which are the different soil processes. And ultimately, they then contribute to the four main soil ecosystem functions, and I'll mention them in a moment. But what I want to say is that nematodes are central to this um, health, soil health interaction map. They are actually second only to fungi and bacteria in terms of the number of processes they contribute towards, and some of those processes we mentioned on the previous slide. But the moral of the story and what I want to get to here is that ultimately, as a result of this interaction or the mind or this interaction map and what's happening in the soil, there are four main functions that ultimately then define the biological component of healthy soils. These four functions need to happen in a soil for it to be healthy, for it to be sustainable in terms of producing crops. So the one we've talked about already, the nutrient cycling. We've, we spoke about how nematodes contribute towards nutrient cycling. We've also mentioned disease and pest regulation, but nematodes also contribute towards carbon and climate regulation. And Hendrik mentioned carbon sequestration, not only for regulating climate, but also for building soil health is really important. And nematodes contribute to that as well. And then also water regulation and purification. They actually have the ability to detoxify some substances by also you know, storing those substances in their bodies. So again, this re-emphasizing the idea that nematodes are really central to healthy soils. The key question might also be, but why do we monitor them? We know that they have an important role to play, but what is the benefit of us really monitoring them? So the truth is, as I also mentioned during the food web slide, is that they are really good bioindicators. And another reason, not just the fact that they are representative of the larger soil food web, is also because Scientists have put a lot of work into developing what we call frameworks or indices to actually use nematodes to tell us more about what's happening in the soil. And that has really been refined over the past 30 years. And uh, the, the index that I'm showing you or the analysis that I'm showing you on the screen now is actually one that's particularly useful. And we see this a lot in scientific works, but also nematode diagnostic laboratories use these kind of analyses to help farmers understand what's happening in the soil ecosystems. So the one you have here on your screen, it, it's based on two indices, the enrichment index, which tells us more about soil fertility and the structure index, which tells us more about the de degree of connectance in the soil food web. So the higher the structure index, the greater energy flows within the soil food web and the greater there is a connectance between the trophic levels. And I want to show you this. This is actually results that we're in the process of publishing, where we have, you'll see the orange dot, that's a conventional field, and it's plotting in the lower left quadrant. That is classified as being degraded and depleted. It's got low enrichment and low structure. But when you look at the green dots, that represents a conservation agriculture system, actually three fields that we studied. And then we have a natural felt also as a reference system. And they're either plotting in the top right or the bottom right quadrant which means that they are either maturing or already matured 
but then also fertile and enriched. It's important to understand that soil ecosystems are variable, they're dynamic, okay? And that's a point that I'll make later, again, is that we need to monitor these changes and that a single data point, a single monitoring event is not sufficient. So in a case like this, you would expect enrichment levels to vary because there's also certain practices that we implement. We apply fertilizers, we apply compost, but the structure of the soil is what we want to build over time. It's smaller increments or smaller increases in structure, but when we implement the right practices, as you can see on this graph, we do begin to see the benefits. I also listed a few do's and don'ts, and this links again to what was said earlier, in terms of what can we do and what shouldn't we do to really build healthy soils, but then ultimately also to help nematodes to really establish thriving communities. Crop diversification is key, something we have to implement and promote. Um, that relates to crop rotation, so not only having a monoculture system, but having multiple cash crops, but then also the incorporation of something like cover crops and multi-species cover crops. What we need to understand is that a specific plant selects for a soil ecosystem or specific species associated with that plant. So having only one plant will only cater for a small portion of what the potential is of that soil. So that's why we really need multiple species also from different functional groups. And we need to have continuous living roots in the soil as far as possible. Avoid fallow periods if you can. And the reason is because it's actually the plant roots through the process of photosynthesis that release exudates, sugars, proteins, etc. And that is what sustains the soil ecosystem. Without that, the soil ecosystem cannot survive and cannot deliver those benefits that we want. Companion planting is something you can consider, really building on mutualistic relationships between plants. Soil cover was also mentioned very important. It serves as a food source for, for the biota, but it also helps regulate extremes in terms of soil temperature. Organic soil amendments is something that's, again, gaining a lot of traction, I believe, personally, it's very good. We ourselves do actually quite a lot of work on compost, using nematodes also as bioindicators of compost quality and maturity. Integrated pest and weed management, I think this is something that's really critical, critical and we often overlook this. Avoid using the harsh chemicals. I know that it's easy and it helps us, you know, just to <laughs> at night, but there are companies out there that are really good in finding cultural biological solutions before we have to go to the hard chemicals. As I said, the chemicals affect the beneficials first, and then only do they somehow affect uh, the They'll just come back. And the problem is they come back in higher numbers because now there's no beneficial to help regulate their populations. Soil monitoring programs is also something that I really advocate. Do not take a single measurement and then what I mean by signal measurement, a single point in time or one sample per field. That cannot be representative of your entire season. It cannot be representative of your entire field. Now, I'm not in this webinar going to explain how we do sampling, but you're welcome to reach out to me. But there's also companies that can advise you on how to actually monitor soil health over time, depending on what fields we're dealing with and the size of the area. A few things to avoid. I've mentioned pesticides, herbicides before, and I always I get in trouble for saying this, but glyphosate has been shown as being something that's really detrimental to soils. And the reason I'm mentioning glyphosate is because I've heard this a few times, people saying that glyphosate serves as a food source to the soil microbiome. Yes, it does get degraded by the soil microbiome, but it still has a toxic effect and it's not good. Inorganic fertilizers is again, something that have a toxicity effect on our soil. So it should be used only when necessary. Don't over apply. And again, with proper monitoring, um, try your precision application of fertilizers only where and when needed. Physical disturbance is something that degrades soil, soil structure, but then also the biology associated. Soil compaction, another issue. In fact, in the project that we're working now with McCain on regenerative agriculture, we're testing uh, control trafficking um, in terms of implements, tractors driving through the field, something that we think will have a, a definite benefit. And then I already mentioned, relying on single data points is something we should definitely um, avoid. I'm getting near the end of my presentation, and uh, what I just want to quickly say is that I am not just saying all of this without any evidence. So I don't want to make this too sciencey, but I'll give you the information I have on this slide as, as proof. So on the left, you see a graph where we've got the structure index, again, which measures the connections in the soil food web, plotted against inorganic nitrogen. And you can see there's a negative relationship. So the higher our inorganic nitrogen levels are, 
the lower our structure is. So again, just showing that it has a negative effect. Conversely, when we look at soil respiration, so this is the graph on the right, plotted against active carbon, it shows a positive indication or positive trend. Respiration is a measure of microbial activity, and active carbon is the fraction of carbon that serves as a food source to the microbes. And although you might think this is common knowledge, here we have the evidence showing that if we provide habitat and if we provide food for our soil microbial home, then they will respond accordingly. And this you can see as respiration, which is the activity of microbes. A few final tips I just want to share with you. In terms of implementing a new system, starting conservation or generative agriculture or agroecology or organic agriculture, start small and grow. Don't risk everything at once. It's important that we learn as we continue doing this. So we also have to farm a start with one field that you know you can manage, implement the changes, and then see how that works out for you and that you can progress and go large over time. Follow a holistic approach. Think about nature. And I think that this is really important. We should start learning more, but also thinking about what would benefit nature, not just crop yield and quality, although that is, of course, important. We need to also start thinking about what practice will really also benefit the soil and soil health. There's no such thing as one system that will work everywhere. Yes, there are principles and guidelines, and, and they are very valuable. But ultimately, we have to go to our own farms, and we have to implement these systems, and we have to test. We have to see the changes over time. And if we monitor, we can see, yes, these pr principles or these practices and some systems are making a difference, or no, we need to maybe alter something. So. Uh, again, very important to, to generate your own data on your own farm. And then accept that you will make mistakes. It's just the reality. That's why I also say start small and then you grow from there. That's part of the process. Linking with thinking about nature is, you know, I always advocate developing a love for small life. Um, it's, I always really enjoyed when we go sampling. Sometimes we, we, the farmers would join us in the field. And sometimes, you know, we, we're sampling, working um, on the soil. Then we, we stand up, we look up, we're looking for the farmer, the farmer's gone. And then we actually often find the farmers, uh, you know, crawling on the soil between the millies, looking for the critters and uh, really getting very, very excited. So it's, it's, we find that it's these farmers that, you know, they really embrace conservation, regenerative agriculture and make it work. Never forget to learn. I think just, just a general model uh, I like to follow as well. And then pay it forward. I think it's really important that we help others to implement, to guide them, to show them how it's done in my farm and to go to their properties and their farm and, and, and show them how it's done and you know, just giving general advice and guidance. So I've given you all this information, but nematodes have explained why um, it's important to monitor them. So this is how you can monitor them. And this is a partnership with laboratories um, that have the expertise. We, of course, do our own analyses, but we're not a diagnostic laboratory at Northwest University. So NEMLAB, is, we know them very well. Uh, Sheila and her team, they've got multiple branches of clubments up into in KZN. They also have the soil health support center side, which if you, for example, want to do the Haney analysis, they can facilitate that for you, send the samples off to the state. So if you want to get into um, analyzing your soils, monitoring your soil ecosystem status, I, of course, will be more than willing to assist. But uh, in terms of a laboratory that can really help you generate data and you know, provide you with a report, um, I you know, recommend you to reach out to NEMLAB and the Soil Health Support Center. Thank you, everyone. That's my presentation. Thank you very much, Gerard. Now, we too know what nematodes are all about. And, uh, but I want to ask you something quite important, in, and that's the fact that the 2023-24 summer grain production season is fast, fast approaching. And uh, what should crop producers or summer crop producers do as far as uh, nematodes are concerned? in preparation for the new production season that's coming? Okay, so I think there's a few considerations and I'll summarize them um, very briefly. Um, for one, I'm not a very big advocate of adding products with the goal of boosting soil biology. I'm not talking about organic amendments such as uh, compost. I'm more referring to bioinoculants. I'm not saying they don't work, but I there's a lot of the products on the market that, that don't work, in fact, that don't have good R&D. So the truth is that 
the the best way to build healthy soils and to build functioning ecosystems is like i said before is to create an environment for them that favors their population growth and that does take time but the implementation of conservation and regenerative agriculture that is the direction that we need to start heading in um, when you if you are thinking about implementing conservation regenerative agriculture with within the next season i strongly advocate that you take baseline samples okay so take samples if you're coming from a conventional system that gives you a really good idea of you know where i'm coming from and then as time progresses within the season but let's say you know over multiple growing seasons you continue your monitoring and you can see the changes that are being implemented that's really the best way um, that we can affect change thank you so much and thank you for your presentation we are saying goodbye to you now just for the moment and until we've got the panel discussion. And uh, we are going on to our next speaker shortly. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Mahavu Mato. Uh, the reason I, I chose to become a soil scientist was because because growing up in the Limpopo, Limpopo province in a village called uh, Mulechi, I saw my parents and uh, grandparents purchasing chemical fertilizers and um, certified seeds. And they would spend a lot of money uh, purchasing this uh, production input. However, when uh, they, at the time of harvesting, they won't harvest much. So I realized that the, there was a problem because they were, they were spending more money on their production inputs, but then they were not harvesting much. So I went to uh, Harry Oppenheimer Agricultural High School. Then I started learning about the conservation uh, practices. Then uh, I then realized that if I, I, I pursue a career in agriculture, I can uh, improve the livelihoods and the socioeconomic outcomes of uh, smallholder farmers in South Africa. I then uh, enrolled uh, for a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, majoring in soil science. And then uh, I then uh, got a scholarship and to study towards a Master of Science in Agriculture, majoring in soil science. And then I participated in the Work Experience Student Program, which was uh, offered by the South African Sugarcane Research Institute as part of my master's research uh, project. Uh, after completing my master's, then I joined the Agricultural Research Council, Natural Resources and Engineering Campus, uh, employed as a researcher. And then I worked with uh, Dr. Hendrik Smith. He's my former boss, so I'm a product of uh, his uh, mentoring and uh, good leadership. Currently, I work with, uh, I work on um, uh, technology, planar smart agriculture, technologies to address uh, challenges that the smallholder farmers are facing, challenges su such as uh, soil degradation, uh, poor crop management, uh, low crop yield, uh, and uh, food insecurity. And then I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Farmers Weekly for inviting me to be one of the panelists at this uh, webinar today. The title of my presentation is Effective Soil Management Practices, Linking Soil Health and uh, Resilience to Achieve Agricultural Sustainability. Okay. The outline of my presentation is as follows. I'll talk about the soil health crisis, soil management, uh, soil health and fertilization, uh, water management, uh, and finally, conservation. The Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils, which is a body uh, under food and agriculture organization defines soil health as the ability of the soil to sustain productivity, uh, diversity, and the environmental services of a terrestrial uh, ecosystem. However, some soils are unable to um, sustain the um, environmental services due to uh, uh, degradation. Okay, thank you. Uh, this uh, slide here shows the vicious cycle of uh, soil health uh, decline due to unsustainable farming practices uh, resulting in land degradation, low yield, uh, food insecurity, malnutrition, and poverty. 
the statistics that you see on the left uh, hand side uh, from the sub-Saharan Africa, about 65% of the cropland is degraded. And that if you look at the pictures uh, at the bottom, uh, the one on the left, they, they look familiar. The one on the left hand side uh, represents a crop failure due to uh, drought. The one in the middle shows uh, erosion, uh, erosion from a field where conventional tillage uh, was practiced. It has been reported that uh, for every one ton of maize we produce, we are losing about uh, three tons of uh, soil due, due to erosion. And the picture on the right hand side, um, normally that is a common uh, condition among uh, small smallholder farmers in South Africa. So what normally happens is uh, farmers, they, they just use uh, any kind of uh, seeds that they come across, whether it's a hybrid or it's a open pollinated variety, they just use uh, uh, the seeds without uh, uh, much information, without uh, knowledge. So in some cases, you find that in this field here, uh, farmers planted the hybrid. And with the hybrid, after harvesting, you can't keep the seed and replant it the following season. So if, if they replant, obviously the yield will be negatively affected. And then if, with the poor crop management, uh, you see in the slide, there's no weeding. Obviously, uh, the farmer won't harvest much there. And then this will, co will continue with the vicious uh, cycle of uh, malnutrition, po food, food insecurity, and poverty. So there's a need to uh, introduce integrated uh, inter uh, interventions such as uh, integrated soil fertility management, uh, water, and uh, crop uh, management. So as to achieve the sustainable uh, development goals and the targets outlined in the chapter five and six of the national development plan. So the next slide here, like I mentioned in my introduction, I worked with Dr. Hendrik Smith, he was my boss. So uh, we, we, we included uh, the same uh, slide in our presentation. So this slide here just shows the, the impact of intensive uh, tillage on uh, organic matter content and the soil quality, soil health in general. So if uh, with the intensive tillage, we, that whole process break down as uh, aggregate, uh, ex uh, exposing uh, soil plant uh, residues to um, uh, decomposition by o o microorganisms. Uh, the whole process of uh, tilling the soil create favorable conditions for uh, oxidation of organic matter. Obviously that result in um, uh, soil being compacted or a low soil fertility status, and then the soil particles are loosely held. And then in, if the soil particles are loosely held and th there's poor aggregation because of low organic matter content, uh, it's easier for the soil to be uh, lost either by wind or water erosion. And then when those soil particles are uh, removed, uh, lost through uh, wind or water erosion, we don't just lose the sediments, we also lose the, the nutrients. So it's either that, all the soil and nutrients uh, eroded from this, the, the soil, maybe by water, will lead to uh, tilting up of uh, dams or uh, water reservoirs, or even uh, eutrophication of uh, rivers or, or or dams. So all this uh, uh, vicious cycle uh, results in hunger, malnutrition, and malnutrition. So according to the statistics, South Africa. In 2019, about 17.3% uh, of the population uh, experienced moderate to severe food insecurity. That number increased in uh, 2020 uh, due to COVID. So most people uh, lost their jobs. So that number increased to about uh, 23%. So we cannot continue uh, with a vicious cycle of uh, soil degradation because uh, that will result in hunger and malnutrition. So we have to introduce a uh, soil conservation uh, me method uh, to uh, improve soil health. Next slide. Uh, soil conservation uh, practices include uh, construction of contours and basin to uh, improve water infiltration and reduce erosion. Like if you see in the top slide there, 
uh, water has been collected in basins, and then you, it will to pre prevent uh, evaporation of that water, crop vestiges or a plant material, dry plant material can also be put in those uh, basins. And then another way is the use of uh, grass mats and the tiva grass to control soil erosion. Next slide. Another way is conversion from uh, conventional tillage to no till. Like you see in, on the left hand side here, those are all the examples of uh, conventional uh, tillage. The soil is left square, uh, the soil is plowed, uh, promoting oxidation of organic matter. So to improve soil health, it would be ideal to uh, convert from uh, conventional to no till, such as the picture on top there is a, the adoption of uh, conservation agriculture uh, in the Limpopo province. Uh, farmers left crop percentages on the soil surface, and then that will uh, improve the water infiltration, uh, conserve moisture, uh, also improve the soil fertility of the soil, improve uh, organic matter content as well. And then in also the inclusion of uh, crop rotation or intercropping in the no-till uh, system will also uh, control pests and diseases, control weeds, and also like in the picture here, it, the legume is being intercropped with maize that will fix uh, nitrogen, thus improving the soil fertility. And uh, conversion from conventional to no-till, there's there's the uh, there's a need to use a uh, specialized uh, equipment. So we we'll move from a mulch plow to uh, specialized equipment equipment such as a uh, matraca hand uh, oper hand operated uh, equipment. Next slide. Like matraca and, and operated uh, equipment, like the, in the picture here, on in one container of the on the left hand side, you uh, farmers would add a uh, fertilizer, and then the, on the right hand side, uh, there's a container. Uh, ripper planter. So with the small scale farmers, sometimes they can't afford fuel for or even pay for tractors. So they use the donkeys and the animals uh, to plant with the no-till. Uh, other uh, conservation uh, methods include the use of uh, infield rainwater harvesting. It's either infield or uh, exfield uh, rainwater harvesting. Infield water harvesting involves a uh, collection of water runoff uh, from the infield. You don't go outside the boundaries of the field. And then the exfield uh, rainwater harvesting, you farmers co construct furrows to channel water from uh, the, the roads into the field. And then both methods of uh, rainwater harvesting allows uh, crop production in arid and uh, semi-arid areas. And they also minimize the the the, the chances of uh, crop failure. And then there's also there's no need for high tech uh, technology. So farmers, uh, even smallholder farmers, uh, can uh, can uh, practice uh, uh, rainwater harvesting. And then with the expert rainwater harvesting, water collected and stored can be used uh, as a supplementary or a deficit uh, irrigation. Another uh, water man management technique is the conversion from a flood irrigation to a uh, irrigation system which promote uh, uh, water use uh, efficiency. A uh, system such as a uh, uh, drip irrigation or a slaky uh, irrigation. Slaky irrigation is part of the Divagri project, which is a brainchild of a uh, German consortium. The project is currently being implemented in the sub-Saharan uh, Africa, uh, in countries like South Africa, Namibia, Mozambique, uh, Zambia, and Botswana. So in here in South Africa, the project is uh, implemented at the Agricultural Research Council and uh, at the University of Stellenbosch. The objective of the project is to increase uh, productivity, uh, income, economic uh, opportunities, and income for farmers in the arid and semi-arid region. 
So CIT stands for self-regulation low energy and uh, play-based uh, irrigation. This is an innovative play-based uh, micro-irrigation system. If you look at, at the structure here, the pipes are arranged in a staggered position. So the pipe is buried and then in the water is released slowly from the uh, play-based uh, uh, pipes. Next slide. In my conclusion, the effective soil management practices contributes to improve soil health and sustainable agriculture. Conservation practices uh, improve uh, soil organic matter content, uh, infiltration rates, conserve moisture, uh, thereby building resilience against seasonal dry spells and reducing the risk of uh, crop failure. And then uh, mainstreaming sustainable agricultural practices can mitigate the negative impact of climate change, address the household food insecurity, and serve as a catalyst for achieving economic transformation in the agricultural sector. Thank you. Mahabo, thank you so very much. I think you've given us a very uh, broad and, uh, and a detailed presentation on why and how conservation agriculture and soil health is so utterly uh, important for the future as well. And now we are going to continue with the panel discussion. And I've already received a few questions from our viewers. Okay, the first question that I have, and uh, that's usually on top of any farmer's mind, is, is it expensive or is it overly expensive to switch from conventional tilling to conservation agriculture? Hendrik, I think uh, you will be able to field this question. Yeah, thank you. Anneli, it's a good question, and it's important to understand that um, to switch over uh, for any farm is, is really difficult, and it needs uh, support as far as and good as possible. Um, that's why we actually should take off our hats for all the pioneer CA farmers who did it actually on their own. They started it in the 80s, 90s, in the 2000s, mostly without any research um, extension and financial support. They did it on their own, which is a really interesting and marvelous story. Um, but uh, most farmers actually will need support. They will need technical support. They will need um, financial support, preferably. Uh, they will need policy support. So, so the better support we can give them, uh, the easier they will go through this transformation process. In terms of finances, the, that's the direct question that uh, that was asked. It is uh, you need to make an investment, a financial investment, to be able to to start and uh, go through this transformation from conventional tillage to fully blown conservation or regenerative agriculture. You need to make that investment and cost money. Um, depending on your context, in, in other words, where you are in terms of knowledge, skills, implements, finances, soil health, etc., all those things determine where you are, your context. So in terms of financial investments, you will have to buy purchase uh, implements, and that's specifically a no-till planter, whether it's hand-operated, animal-operated, tractor-operated, doesn't matter. Uh, you will have to have a, a sprayer to because chemical applications of herbicides, especially in the, in the beginning and perhaps always is going to be required. But if you have uh, want to go big, especially as a commercial farmer, and you need to integrate livestock on a much larger scale, you also need to invest in, in more animals. And all of these things cost money, but let's leave the skills and knowledge and uh, the technical assistance aside for now, you also need that. Uh, but fi financial assistance and investments, whether your own investment, your own capital, or getting capital from elsewhere is important. And we do a lot of work on, on, on that in terms of 
assessing that, modeling that. We call that investment dip, the financial dip, the J curve. You have you make that financial dip, investing in new things, like I said, implements, livestock. Etc. So you, you most of the farms will go through the financial dip. It's not necessarily a production dip. If you do the principles correctly, you won't necessarily have a production dip. That I just need to emphasize that. In some cases, when you make mistakes, when it is difficult to apply the principles, uh, and it, it is a new thing, you make mistakes, you you might go through a, a production dip as well. Um, but we're doing those kind of assessments and models, modeling to see what, in what context, what regions will be the J curve. And then we also, on the, on the other end, uh, uh, take hands with investment uh, companies, partners that help farmers to uh, invest capital uh, and help them to go through this tech, the investment dip, the J curve. And but also provide them with with um, technical assistance on the other end. I hope that uh, answers the question to some extent. It does. It actually does. And now we're mo moving on to Mahabu. Mahabu, uh, I've got a, a viewer who sent an email asking how can he or she determine what the condition of his soils or the farm soils are. Is there somebody that come can come and do uh, soil testing? Who can he or she contact to come and help him with this condition of the soils? Um, I need for the question. The farmer can uh, collect uh, soil samples and then maybe through the assistance of the uh, local uh, extension officers, uh, depending on the location. And then maybe uh, a lo local uh, department of agriculture, the extension officers will be available to assist uh, with soil sampling. And then uh, the soil samples will be submitted for analysis. And then um, the, the, the results of the soil analysis will present uh, the chemical the normally the, the standard uh, target for farmers, the, the, the results will, will, will present the physical and the, the, the physical and the chemical uh, indicators of uh, soil quality. And then it, maybe also if a farmer uh, requested for recommendations, uh, the soil analysis results will be accompanied by uh, the recommendations. And then there's a specific uh, cost for like analysis for various uh, indicators. Like uh, normally if a farmer requests uh, soil, uh, the analysis for soil biological indicators like uh, uh, the mi microorganisms, they will be a, a, a specific uh, a, a cost for that. But then with the normal target for uh, farmers, uh, that will include the, the analysis of uh, physical and uh, chemical uh, soil health indicators. And another thing, a, a soil sample does not consist of a shovel full of soil from the topsoil of, of a field or a, a, a crop field. There are specific depths and, and standards and so on that should be followed. Can you please tell us about more than that? More about yes. that. Yes, the, normally depending on the locality in South Africa, I know in KZN, the, the KZN Department of Agriculture, they have a specific equ equipment for soil sampling. So it just uh, collect the, to the correct de depth, normally to a depth of uh, 20 to 30 centimeters. But then with the small scale farmers, we normally encourage them to use the spade, the normal spade. The size of uh, the normal spade, the, the size of that uh, of the shovel, if you put it into the soil, that is uh, 30 centimeters. So farmers can collect uh, soil samples to a depth of uh, 20 to 30 centimeters randomly, and then they should also look into factors such as uh, uh, slope. If obviously if the slope is uh, is steep, 
the soil color uh, is going to vary. And then if the soil color varies, then the, the soil samples should be collected uh, separately, even though the uh, crop history, uh, historical uh, use of the land is the same. The soil samples should be uh, sampled separately. On steep slope, uh, the color will differ. Uh, the soil texture will also differ. So those soil samples must be uh, sampled uh, separately. And then also what they should also look uh, into when they collect the soil samples is, is for different uh, fields. Like let's say if in one field you planted uh, beans, another field you planted uh, maize, those uh, soil samples cannot be combined. And then for shifting to on a, on a field of uh, 15 to 20 hectares, farmers can collect about uh, 25 uh, sub, uh, samples. And then they combine them together and take a representative soil sample about uh, one kilogram. And then take uh, the soil sample for analysis to a private laboratory or uh, the extension officers, uh, the government departments will always uh, assist farmers uh, as to where to take those uh, soil samples for analysis. Thank you. And then Gerard, I think uh, this question is for you. Can you provide information on nematode resistant crop varieties and how effective these varieties are, if there are any? Yeah, so that's a very good question. There are definitely a lot of work going into developing cultivars and screening cultivars for the what we call host plant status. So there's definitely, within most cash crops, actually cultivars that are resistant um, to specific nematodes, for example, root knot nematodes. Um, I don't have that information on hand, but if, pro if farmers are interested in generating that information or getting that information, I can provide that. So I've got a number of colleagues that are focusing on the plant parasites and they will be able to assist. So the information can be found on Google. Some of it is, is generally available. But if, if someone has got a specific request for crops and or cultivars, um, they're welcome to reach out and I can help them with that. Farad, and I've also got another question for you. Is nematode or nematode of pathogenic nematodes uh, detectable by the naked eye? So and generally not. Pardon? So the nematode itself is, is generally not detectable because they are very small. Um, however, some of the nematodes, for example, root knot nematode, the female, adult females are actually quite big. And when they latch onto the roots or they, their bodies grow onto the roots, you can actually see that when you pull the roots out of the soil. But the, the best symptom to go by, for example, uh, fibrosic nematode, such as root knot nematode, is the symptoms in the root itself. So that picture that I showed earlier of that heavy nodulated root, or um, that's really a, a telltale sign of, of root knot nematode in, infestation. And then when you look at the, a field in general, there are some symptoms that you can see. So what's probably important to understand is also that nematode infestations, like biology in general, is not homogenous. So in other words, it's not going to be the same in terms of the number of nematodes throughout the field. Mm -hmm. So when you have an area where there's high infestations and infestation of the root of the plant itself, mm -hmm. um, that area will look different. And it's usually poor growth, um, less dense vegetation. Mm -hmm. The yellowing of the plants can also be evident. Um, that's when you start investigating and see what could the possible cause be for mm -hmm. poor plant growth or poor plant performance. When you dig up the roots, then you can see some of the systems on the root or the symptoms on the roots. But ultimately, it is very important um, to send those samples away for analysis. I mentioned uh, NEM Lab. They, of course, can also do the plant parasitic nematodes. Thank you so much. Uh, then we also have a question that somebody sent, and I think this is for you, Hendrik. The question reads as follows. I want to find out what would be the best cover crop composition by taking into account factors like market or end use of the intended crop, feasibility thereof, and soil health of the area to be planted to these uh, crop combinations. 
Yeah, that depends very much in what area that farmer is and what uh, the, the farming system is. So that, that's my first question. Um, but in general, we grow cover crops for various purposes. It's a multifunctional, not multi-purpose purpose tool that we in, include um, in, in conservation agriculture. It's a very important tool. And uh, first of all, while this is a soil health topic, we want to include cover crops to speed up the restoration regeneration of soil health because as we've seen it is so our soils are mostly degraded we want to speed up the process normal no-till no systems in other words no-till planter combined with maize soil rotation or maize so sunflower rotation doesn't really uh, accelerate or speed up the, the restoration of soil health in other words carbon buildup so we want to accelerate that and that's why we in, we want to have quality application of all the principles including diversity and that's where cover crops comes in we, we increase the diversity of crops through multi-species cover crops and the integration of animals so the use of cover crops is primarily in our context in south africa for livestock integration it's not for a market in most cases obviously if you are in a specific situation, you can grow cover crop species, mostly single species, and harvest them to produce for a market. But, but then you have to have that relationship with, with cover crop companies, with seed companies. So uh, irrespective of where you are, depending on where you are, what system you have, you integrate um cover crop multi-species cover crop systems either summer cover crops and or winter cover crop systems in you can you rotate that with uh, typical cash crop systems like maize and soybean it could also be integrated with um with orchards within orchards like um, citrus nuts uh, vineyards etc etc so you can e uh, easily integrate plant cover crops in those systems and bring in animals in a really well managed manner to have an impact on your soil health uh, on your total agri ecosystem health but also improve and sustain your income your profitability of your system through cover crops Hendrik, is there something like a, a, a conservation agricultural asso association or body where interested viewers uh, that interested viewers can join and maybe gain more information and advice on the matter? The association that we have is called the Region South African Association. There's a website and this is like it's like a slightly loose association uh, we mm -hmm. have a couple of uh, conservation agriculture uh, uh, groups um, study groups networks uh, whatsapp groups <clears throat> and we're trying to establish more and more of these just to, to speed up the communication and sharing between farmers specifically because that's where most of the information lies so yes there, there is uh, something and but one of our uh, advice is, is actually to start forming your own group wherever you are if you if you really feel a need and you see the need among other farmers you just need to come together and start your own group and working together start to test ideas and learn together and share and reach out to others in your area but also across uh, the boundaries of your district of your province of your country and then and that's why how we actually expand our 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 knowledge system. I just also want to measure we have <clears throat> frequent uh, conferences, farmers' days in South Africa. So you've got to look out for that. Next year in July, we actually have the World Congress on Conservation Agriculture in South Africa in Cape Town in July next year. That's going to be a big gathering where we're going to learn 
and share right across the world lessons um, from scientists, but also farmers. So it's uh, something to, to look out for. Thank you so much for that good news. Uh, Mahadu, I think this question is also for you. How to control low yields and the, uh, how do I determine the nu nutrient deplete depletion of my soils if I'm an emergent farmer? We have sort of covered this before, but specifically for the emerging farmers, how do they go about? Okay, the first step is to collect soil samples, and then you, from the soil analysis results, uh, they will be able to establish how much, uh, mm -hmm. if, if ever they, they have to apply fertilizers, uh, if they can afford uh, chemical fertilizers, how much fertilizers uh, to, 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 uh, to, to apply. Or in cases where they are not able to, uh, they can't afford to uh, pay for soil analysis, they can just use whatever materials that they have, the locally available resources. They can uh, do, uh, uh, use composting, use crawl manure, use, use the crop processes is, instead of training them or uh, feeding them to, uh, or allowing animals to go inside the, uh, in the field. They can uh, leave those crop processes there and then they uh, add fertilizers or even crawl manure. Or crawl manure does not only add fertilizers to the soil, they also act as a, a soil conditioners. So there is, there's more that uh, emerging farmers can use uh, with the locally available uh, resources to improve uh, their soils. So material, locally, they can use the locally available material to improve uh, soil quality. And Thank also you so much. Please carry on. They can also contact the local uh, office of the Department of Agriculture, or they themselves they can form a, a group, a farmer association where they learn from each other. Anneli, if I may add there, please. Yes, yeah, sure. That's very important what Mahabu said. Um, and the question is also how do I stop? With the leakages, with the with the with the soil degradation, if I understand it correctly, well, mm -hmm. the, the first step is to stop with uh, conventional tillage practices, because that's where your nutrients are going. That's where your soil organic carbon is going, uh, disappearing, degrading, nutrients uh, removed out of 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 the system, soil actually lost through erosion, etc. So, so you need to stop the leakages. And you need to you do that by stopping conventional tillage practices and transforming as quickly and best and soon towards conservation agriculture practices. Um, Herat alluded to his nice uh, few tips on how to start. That's very important. Start sl uh, small, sl start slow. But the first thing is also gather enough information. Uh, take take about sometimes a year to to learn about the system go see go attend farmers days conferences spend time on youtube most farmers says they 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 learn the most from youtube so there's wonderful videos and information on the internet on youtube on social media just take enough time to learn about the system make that mind uh, shift um because Unless you do that, you won't change. You won't trans transform your system. And then start small. Prepare. Look at your soils. See if the, your soils are, 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 are fine. They don't have compaction, acidity. Try to alleviate those before you start. And then design your system. Uh, what kind of rotations are you going to bring in cover crops and livestock? Design that and start on a small scale. Get the right planter implements and learn by doing experimenting in a group and as you build up confidence build up your skills and knowledge you expand your system from one field to the second to the rest of your farm as best and quickly as possible obviously as we've repeatedly said today you will make mistakes but that is how you grow and that's how you learn and uh, that's how you 
um, build your uh, farm into a more profitable and resilient system? I've uh, also received a, a question about El Nino, and I think it's a very relevant uh, question. The effect of climate change and El Nino, what is the possible effect thereof on soil health, and the what principles and practices should be implemented to counteract or mitigate these effects from El Nino and, and climate change? Well, the principles is, are exactly those ones we share today, the principles of soil health for conservation agriculture. Those ones will build a re more resilient, climate resilient system. In other words, it builds your soil health uh, we call it a soil sponge, more carbon in the in the soil, build, improve the soil sponge. In other words, it holds more water. If you have cover on your soil, you have a cooler soil, lower temperature, you allow water to infiltrate, not run off. Every drop of water counts, especially in dry periods. You want water not to evaporate from the bare soil. You want it to be to infiltrate. Uh, into the healthy soil, healthier soil and be used by plants, specifically permanent plants with plants systems on the soil, with living roots in the soil, feeding, building soil as, as you grow, as you produce. You also uh, you need to use uh, more resilient, drought resilient crops. Um, uh, that is for cash crops, but also for cover crops. You need to integrate livestock because livestock is actually in drought period, dry periods, a much more resilient and low risk system. Uh, cash crops, some cash crops can really be de demolished by a, a dry period uh, or a drought season. Uh, but livestock, especially when it has good fodder in the form of, of pastures or cover crops, can be more resilient. So those are the principles and practices we need to be really uh, focusing on to, to build a, a more climate resilient system. I think we've come to the end of our session of questions. I think we received, uh, uh, well, we did receive a wide variety of questions on various matters as far as soil health is concerned really appreciate the fact that you as pa panel members were prepared to join our webinar and uh, I wish you all the best as far as improving the soil health of South Africa is concerned. Thank you and goodbye.